Hi, everybody. This is the 12th week of the 13-week series on the book of Nehemiah. And I uh, trust that you have learned as much out of this as I have. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said the Pledge of Allegiance? I know I did. I grew up in the, gen in the generation where every day at the beginning of the school day, we would stand, place our hand over our heart, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. How serious were you when you say the pledge to our country's flag? What difference does reciting that pledge make in your life? What other pledges have you taken over the course of your life? Perhaps you have taken out loans or signed contracts for work that you were going to complete. How seriously did you take those pledges? Our ultimate allegiance should be to God. We ought to trust Him and therefore pledge to obey Him. This lesson provides an example of a pledge to God and a challenge to consider to whom we have pledged our lives. Let's search the scriptures for a while. After God brought revival to Jerusalem's population through a public reading of the scriptures, the people conducted a spontaneous six-hour public prayer meeting. Such a meeting had not occurred since the dedication of Solomon's temple. We'll find that in 2 Chronicles 6, 12 through 42. At the conclusion of Jerusalem's heartfelt prayer, the people made a new commitment before the Lord. Nehemiah 10 gives us the details of that public commitment. They gave a pledge of obedience. The definition of a covenant is a formal binding agreement a compact, or a contract. Probably the most common covenant that we are familiar with and it would come to mind is the covenant of marriage. That is a binding legal transaction. It includes witnesses and signed documentation. The covenant made by the Jews under Nehemiah's leadership was essentially a renewal of their pledge to keep the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant begins with the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19 and runs through Deuteronomy 28. The covenant is conditional, meaning the Jews would receive God's blessing outlined in the covenant if they obeyed the accompanying commandments. If they broke the commandments, they would experience the curse outlined in the covenant. Let's look at the makers of the oath. The first section of chapter 10, uh, in there, Nehemiah records the names of those who signed the covenant renewal. As a leader, Nehemiah signed it first. By signing the covenant, he identified with the people of Jerusalem and publicly pledged his dependence upon God for his obedience to him. Following Nehemiah's lead, the other civil leaders and religious leaders put their seals to the agreement. Twenty-four princes and priests, 17 Levites, and 44 heads of families signed the agreement. Since it was impossible for everyone to sign the document, the rest of the people aligned with these leaders to make a verbal oath. It was a very serious obligation. And the people entered into it willingly. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7 makes this concept clear. Better is it that thou shouldst not vow that thou shouldst vow and not pay. Let's read that section in Ecclesiastes. 
Again, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifices of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay it to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there is also vanity. But fear God. While the vow was not foolish, it was serious. The people bound themselves and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk God's law, to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments. Now, that should be a red flag to us, to do all of the commandments. Such public commitments were related to the fact that the Old Testament people of God were a nation living together in covenant with him. As mentioned already, the Jews were committed to obey the Mosaic covenant and was already binding. That covenant was already binding upon them. As church-age believers, we aren't under the Mosaic Covenant in that the specific blessings and cursing attached to God's commandments were only for the Jews. Many of God's commands in the Mosaic Covenant, however, included all but the Ten Commandments, all of the Ten Commandments but one, and are repeated in the New Testament. God wants to wants us to obey those commandments out of love for Him. Our obedience brings us blessings like peace and joy and commitment and contentment, but not the bountiful rains or bumper crops promised in the Mosaic Covenant. If we disobey God, He will chasten us in various ways to get our attention and to draw us back to Him. But we won't necessarily experience drought or be kicked out of our homes. Though we aren't under the Mosaic Covenant, we should always abide by the commitments we make through the words in the course of all kinds of conversations. Jesus emphasized this in Matthew 5, 33-37, and James reiterated this concept in James 5.2. And let's read James 5.2 together. 5.2 says this, Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Excuse me, that should have been James 5.12. That's why it didn't make any sense to me. Now, those of you that have been in the other 11 lessons know that I do this occasionally. I'll have a brain bubble. James 5.12. But above all, brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no lest you fall into judgment. That makes more sense, doesn't it? The Apostle Peter attempted to make grandiose claims on occasions. And we can find those in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. But he learned through experience the, these statements were easier to make than to keep. 
and far less important than obedience without presumption. Let's look at the terms of the oath that the people took. The bottom line of the pledge that the people of Nehemiah's time made to God is recorded in the second half of Nehemiah 10, 29. Let's find that. Nehemiah 10, 29, the last part of that says this. Observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his ordinance and his statutes. Now, Jerusalem citizens promised to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, including God's moral, civil, and ceremonial laws. In both Nehemiah's prayer and the people's prayer, those praying confessed that they had violated all three aspects of God's law. As the people came off their experience in chapters 8 and 9 that we dealt with, with last week, the types of sins that had brought the Babylonian captivity of the nation were foremost on their minds. Thus, they made this pledge that dealt with marriage, the obser observation of the Sabbath day and sabbatical year, the care of the house of the God, and the matters of offerings and giving of first fruits and tithes. In taking this solemn oath, the people pledged themselves to their own curse and thereby recognized God's chastisement for disobedience as outlined in the Mosaic Covenant. God had specifically commanded the people of Israel not to intermarry with those who were not the covenant people. He did so to preserve their spiritual purity. Nevertheless, intermarriage became a besetting sin for Israel. They fell into that sin not long after occupying the Promised Land. God faithfully judged them according to the Mosaic Covenant. We'll find that in Judges. During the period of monarchy, Solomon led the nation into chaos, and as a result of, that was a result of his blatant disobedience to God's laws governing marriage. We'll find that in 1 Kings. Even when the people returned to Jerusalem from captivity, they brought this sin back with them. We saw in the book of Nehemiah the disastrous results that this behavior brought on God's people. And that was back in chapter 6 of Nehemiah. The nation never seemed to learn from their past sins. Think back and try to remember why it would have been tempting for the Jews to intermarry with pagans as they returned from captivity. If you remember, they were surrounded by potential enemies and a marriage alliance would have given them a measure of physical security because the whole land was surrounded. If you think back, they would remember the whole land was surrounded by enemies. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Let's see if I can find that here. There we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. And God both raised up the Lord, and God raised up the Lord and will also raise up by his power. Oh, through 7 1, that's what I'm doing. Through 14, let's keep reading. We'll start with verse 14. There we go. Forgive my rattled head this morning. 15 starts with this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of the harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Talks about purity, doesn't it? Now, God talks about not being unequally yoked, and marriage is the obvious application of that restriction. But I have also heard teaching that that applies in business too and any other agreements we would enter into. Let's look at Nehemiah 10, 31. If the peoples of the land brought wares for, or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we should not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and we would forego the seventh year produce and the exacting of every debt. In the law, God commanded the people of Israel to keep the Sabbath day holy as a day of rest. Motivated by greed and selfish ambition, the people had frequently violated this law. They valued material gain over their identification with the Lord of the Sabbath. They pledged to observe the Sabbath just as God required. Now the Jews understood that it had been due in part to their violation of the law of the Sabbath and the seventh year Sabbath. They, they understood the correlation between that and how God allowed the Babylonians to take them captive. God had warned his people that there would be one year of captivity for every year of failure to institute the law. Now, God does not require believers to keep the Sabbath, but how might greed and selfish ambition show themselves in a believer's life today? Maybe we'll fill our time with our own schedule and without consideration for what God would have him do. We might adopt selfish goals and ignore others' needs and simply take care of ourselves. In the final specific pledge of the agreement, the people promised to support God's work financially. They promised to give the temple an annual offering of a third of a shekel God's law required an annual offering of half a shekel. Now, that to me suggests that the Jews didn't think that they could afford God's minimum requirement. Offerings received at the temple provided for the showbread, sacrifices, feasts, and other services. The Lord's work depended on the faithful giving of God's people. Other promises included the contribution of wood to burn on the altar whenever they had sacrifices, the bringing of the first fruits of crops and trees, and the dedication of their firstborn sons and animals. 
what is the correlation between a person's faith in God and his giving? Seems to me that a person of strong faith in God gives without apprehension about his own needs. He understands that God will take care of him. The final words of the Jews' oath summed up all that the people have coven had covenanted to. We will not forsake the house of our God. What does dedication to God mean to us as church-age believers who are not under the law, but under grace? Well, we give of ourselves in response to his love and grace. We depend on God's grace for the power to live obediently to him. We show reverence to God and respect him. We seek to bring glory to God with our lives, we faithfully represent God in the world. Let's move on to the second part of our lesson, the act of trust in Nehemiah 11, 1 through 36. When Nehemiah laid the groundwork for the city's resettlement, he must have known the timing was not right. After the nation's renewal, the people were ready for the repopulation phase of Nehemiah's plan. Obedience and trust work together. Having renewed their commitment to the Lord, the people were ready to repopulate Jerusalem. Their confession of sins and promises to observe the law put their minds at ease. They no longer feared an enemy attack as part of God's chastening hand. Let's look at the settlement in Jerusalem. That's going to be verses, chapter 11, verses 1 through 24. No, I'm not going to read it, so relax. The rulers who dwelt in Jerusalem were primarily to maintain the temple. By casting lots, the leaders determined who else should be included in the 10% of Judah's population to relocate inside the rebuilt city. The use of lots prevented favoritism or inequity in such a serious choice. All those were selected, no doubt accepted, this as God's sovereign will, for they moved to Jerusalem willingly. Now I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers here. A total of 3,044 men and their families moved from the general region of Judah to inside the city walls of Jerusalem. These included 468 from the tribe of Judah, 928 from the tribe of Benjamin, 1,192 priests, 284 Levites, and 172 porters or gatekeepers. Nehemiah's careful plan had finally been implemented. The second part of that, in the last part of chapter 11, deals with the settlement near Jerusalem. Others of the tribe of Judah had settled in 17 towns and communities near Jerusalem. Some settled as far south as Beersheba, and that's 22, 30, excuse me, 32 miles away. North of Judah, some of the tribe of Benjamin settled in 15 towns and villages. The remaining Levites settled in both regions. Nehemiah certainly exercised grace along with his regulatory plan. Everything appeared to be in perfect order within the city, except for the fact that each person was still a sinner. No doubt they began to compromise and break God's commands soon after their pledge to obey them. Several questions coming at you now. When have you failed to keep a promise you made to God? 
to what do you attribute that failure? Why can't we count on our good intentions as the impetus for spiritual growth in our lives? Our good intentions are powerless to change our lives. In fact, we're relying on ourselves when we have good intentions to change. What can we count on for change in our lives? We can count on the power of the Holy Spirit. Good intentions are powerless to change us. In fact, we need, we need to stop relying on ourselves and rely on Him. We can count on God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, they are activated as we put our faith in God and count on His grace for spiritual growth. Human effort and simply trying harder will not bring about consistent obedience in our lives. This is the so what portion of every lesson that I give. What's it mean for us today? In what ways do we need to grow spiritually in our lives? What steps will we take to facilitate growth in those areas in our lives? Spiritual growth will not take place outside of God's grace. A promise to grow will not automatically tra translate into growth. As we put our faith in Him and seek Him through His Word and prayer, He empowers us through His Spirit to grow. We talked about the, the besetting sin that the children of Israel there in Jerusalem committed. What is our besetting sin? Now this may be different for every person, just as the people of Nehemiah's day, they faced different types of sins that tempted them. Before I pray, think about the song, Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's pray together. Father, might the words of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, and the work of your Holy Spirit penetrate deeply into our hearts and then out into our lives as we become examples to a world that desperately needs you. Whether we recognize it or not, we are an example of either good or bad. Oh God, might it be an example of, of committed, surrendered lives to you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now next week is our last lesson. It's going to be chapters 12 and 13. And the title of that is Compromising Again. So till next week, you have a blessed week. Bye now.